Hello. Let me try to find a good position for this. It's okay? Loud enough? Great. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, first of all, this is not about NLP. I think I'm in the wrong session. <laughs> no, actually, NLP is a tiny part of my work, and um, the idea is that we are interested in how knowledge spreads in general, and I will briefly motivate our research later. And uh, what I present today was basically an excuse for myself to finish a software package. So I'm basically talking about a software package I had to write, and this is for disentangling scientific fields. Uh, this is part of a team effort, uh, the Matheson team. I will later show some pictures. And uh, together, uh, so to say, the field historian um, that was at the base of this is Roberto Lali, who is an expert in the history of physics. And he's now in Turin. And not today, today he. Um, us, we are from the MPI for History of Science, and we are interested in our department on structural changes in systems of knowledge. Systems of knowledge that could be intuitive knowledge from the level of newborn children, Practical knowledge, if you like build a boat together, you have to like somehow bring this knowledge of how to build a boat into future generations. And most interesting to myself, theoretical knowledge. So something that you are able to formalize. And the most easiest, uh, I think, or most well-known system of formalized knowledge are our scientific publications. And this is also kind of the low-hanging fruit that we can think of, so because we have this vast amount of data. Um, in the past, lots and lots and lots of colleagues worked on structural changes in systems of knowledge with classical um, history of science methods. And my idea at the start of this project model then was to formalize this. So how can we build something that quantitatively expresses the structural changes? Little did I know how complicated that would become. The idea at the core is that we think of knowledge as socio-epistemic networks. So knowledge is never knowledge in itself, it's embedded in social relations, in how we express our knowledge, in the words that we can use to express knowledge and transport it to further generations. And that this, it's not really separatable because it's belonging all together, so it's a multi-layered structure. And each of the structures can have sub-structures that are becoming important. If you think about scientific publications, you have co citations, direct citations, bibliometric coupling, and the likes. If you think about language, you have single words, engrams, concepts, you can think about topics, how they spread in time, and so on. In the future, actually, I shift my, will my shift my research to also include environmental relations. So how does the environment that we live in is actually influencing what we can think and what is surviving for future generations? So that's strongly depending on the environment, actually. As you already can imagine, it's quite a complicated system, and we have to think of different levels of tackling this question. So we can take the stuff that, we, that has survived as an archive and look at it from like a bird's eye view. So that would be our, our classical, we are in the now and we look at the past, what we call the macro level. We can try to understand single relational changes in this big bunch of archival data where we can try to get an understanding of how, why certain things happen and that's why uh, our colleague um, Bernardo Boac is working on agent-based modeling to tackle this meso layer of how knowledge spreads. And we can, of course, also do micro-studies. We can think of a single agency, like a, a tiny thing like the Max Planck Society, how do funding changes change future research, for example? Or how does this conference that we have in the moment change what we will be able to think about in the future? And all of this is really interesting, but I will not talk about this at all today. <laughs> what I want to talk about is disentangling scientific fields. And this is, so to say, the core of that was that our colleague Roberto Lali worked on the history of general, um, general relativity. And there's a, an evolution in that field which we, was not really explainable by classical um, citation-based measures because there was, like basically Einstein came up with all the nice ideas. Three years later, everyone had worked out the low-hanging fruits and nothing happened for 30 years. And then it came up, it really became part, an essential part of what we think of physics. Why did that happen? And that was, so to say, the idea why we wanted to look in this corpus, this very specific corpus of NASA, NASA's ADS, so the uh, astronomical data something. I forgot what the acronym is about. Please help me out if you later. Um, it's about 30 million publications, and their claim was we only collect astrophysics. Then we did some topic modeling across all times, just a rough sketch, and it turned out, okay, there's educational sciences in that. We don't really know why they collected, and they were not able to tell us what is the range and how complete are they. 
So we ha had to somehow try to make sense of this huge amount of data and with structural views. And that's how, to say, this untangling came into play. And the idea is uh, very basic. So in, if you go into a certain year, you have co-cited papers. And these co-cited papers are, so to say, expanding the front of knowledge at that time. So if in 1950 I cite a paper from 1925 and 1935, I would create a link between these two cited papers, but put the time stamp 1950 on that, because that's the knowledge I have in 1950. And there's quite general relations of how far in the past we normally cite across 50 years, that's quite stable if you take out effects like war and so on. If you just um, generate this co-citation networks, we come into this uh, problem of fuzzy hairballs, so we cannot say anything, and they are time sliced. And this is just, it becomes gigantic also only for the subfield of NASA ADS. You have like, I think uh, at, in the end, in the 2000s, you have one network for a year being a, a GB of just text. You know? So it's, it's not really nice. Ah, yeah, and uh, check out this documentation. It's, so say, as I said, it's a software package. So all of the steps that um, I explain here and later are in the software package, actually. And I hope the documentation is enough for you to understand it. If you uh, put any issues in the GitLab, it's even better. Um, the idea then was to connect these time layers by finding pairs of co-sided papers across time. And there, the authors of this great package, Leiden, from the Leiden algorithm, so they titled from Lovain to Leiden, um, because it was an extension of the Lovain uh, clustering algorithm. So the idea was that they provided a, a small helping um, tool that was able to consider time as an additional layer, so that in the end you get in time extended clusters of co cited papers. And it's a density based approach, so we have to rerun this all the time to find a useful set of parameters and then analyze the result that we get. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Then we have this bunch of like 200, 300,000 papers. So still we have to make sense of this huge amount of stuff. And one way to do that was with NLP. Yay, we have NLP, great. Um, so we start with only structure, but then we try to look at the content. And let's simply do statistics of who is writing this 200,000 papers in average. So who are the most uh, famous guys in this? who are the most famous institutions in this, and then do topic modeling. And this is generating a report for, uh, in this case, Roberto Lali, to look at and tell me, this is rubbish, continue. Or get rid of this cluster and rerun the whole circle, because this cluster is definitely not belonging to astrophysics. So this is the circle that I'm talking about. So I'm really uh, relying on, the, on this close intervention between field scientists and programming the actual software. So that's really crucial. In the end, we are also making use of visualizations. Uh, so to say we have not only the reports, we also have to understand why, how does the structures change in time. And let's see if this works, yeah. So this is how it starts. So you have this really big bunch of uh, huge cluster and you can't really say why. Well, it turns out it's just solid state. So because solid state physics was so eminent and it belonged to astrophysics in the beginning because they first has, had to develop the detectors. They had to send up the satellites. So that was considered part of astrophysics but they never stopped collecting it, so it was really a huge bunch of stuff. Getting rid of this, that this big cluster, we see a bit more structure, and you see, okay, there's suddenly genes popping in. That's maybe astrobiology uh, from the 2000s, and then feeding back, so they still collect stuff that is not really astrophysics, astrobiology, of course, uh, as a field didn't emerge, I think, maybe after this. So we still have to rinse and repeat the circle of getting rid of stuff, trying to make sense of the, single, of the single clusters. If we do that, in the end we come to a plot like this, which is really then related to astrophysics. So this is the result of, I think, seven iterations and sitting down a few hours every day to discuss this different things. What come out in the end, so in this document, okay, this is uh, atom physics, this is particle physics. And then you can start making sense of some parts of the evolution of um, the output generated on in, uh, in and around astrophysics. Um, that was one thing, but then we were also interested in the, so to say, the structural relations of these clusters <coughs> and try to come up with ways to calculate centralities in these networks. So as you remember, there are like co-citation networks across time, and you can think of measures like centralities, like degree, uh, authority, between us, and so on, but you have to do that in a time-extended way. So the idea is that you normalize 
for each year centralities for the whole graph. Then you bin it, so how many normalized um, uh, nodes have this normalized centrality, and this bins we can extend in time. So you have uh, logarithmic binning in this axis and time in this axis, and this is, so say, everything. And then we look at one cluster's papers and do the same for only the cluster papers, and that are then the black dots. And that way you can try to get a feeling of how central in research the subfields of astrophysics are across time. And as an additional step in that point, um, point we were also interested in the role of the Max Planck Society in itself. And that's, uh, it's hardly to see, I think, um, it's hard to see. So the red dots would then be the Max Planck Society's role in one specific cluster of astrophysics. And that's, so to say, how we can, again, rinse and repeat, try to interpret these results, get a field scientist to, to make sense of them, so I maybe I would say the, the point is that this software is not, so to say, the solution, but it's a piece in a puzzle. And so to say that, that's the part which I call this humanistic circle. And it's, there are time steps to consider. So it's very fast and only one off to build this co-citation networks. But then finding these classes is an extremely slow process. And if you have no idea of where to look for the right parameters, it can be really a week-long exercise to just find approximately the right parameters. Um, it's as, as, uh, written here, so we have like 12 million nodes in uh, only the giant components, so I have, have already dropped out stuff that is not really connected um, across the years. 430 million edges, that makes it really memory intensive, and one calculation takes like eight hours. So if you think of, of this as being part of a research cycle, we are, we are actually also coming in the point where it's, okay, it's taking time, yes, but it's also not very green, right? So because we have to do this calculation over and over again. And that's, that's a shame because uh, this is only 30 million page, um, publications, but if you think about bigger like repositories like Dimensions, it's 130 million. So um, I think with that uh, sad note, I thanks a lot for your attention. And as I said, this is a team effort and look around to find team members and ask them or me later in the Q&A. Thanks a lot.